Confession. I used to keep a secret diary as a young boy, maybe slash teenager. Uh, but in this, in this little book, uh, I think it was blue, might have been purple, doesn't matter, but it had like a little padlock and little keys and I would write down my secret little thoughts and I'd lock it and I'd hide the keys in my sock drawer because as for some reason, as, a, as an adolescent, I thought I had all these great little thoughts I needed to keep secret when probably it was just little crushes or stupid little things like that. But I remember I'd write in it for a long time and then years later I came back to it and opened it up and I remember just cringing and just thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe I used to think like that or, or why did I write that? It was just embarrassing. And so needless to say, the book got binned and no one ever needed to know about my crush on Hermione Granger. Um, <laughs> but you have these moments, right? We all have these moments when we, we look back at something that we read or, or you watch those old videotapes and you think, ah, oh, I can't believe I used to be like that. Ah, oh, I can't believe I said that or what was I thinking? You know, because we live in a fallen world, our, our natural trajectory in life starts from chaos and, and it's marred by sin that we, we, we start out needing to learn how to be good and needing to learn how to, how to grow and how to mature in our life. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, the, the trajectory in terms of character, in terms of maturity over life should, should be up. And I wonder if you ever have those moments where you look back at something that you read, that you, that you wrote, or you look back on an old video and you think, oh, I can't believe I used to think like that, or I can't believe I said that. And you might look back on mistakes that you've made in your younger years, things that you did maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, things that you regret, or you think, oh, I can't believe I, I said something, I did something so foolish. You know, because we live in a world that is marred by, by sin, by brokenness, you know, the, our natural bent is, is just towards making mistakes. And we're not as good as we want to be. You know, as, as children, children don't need to learn how to make mistakes and do wrong things. They actually need to learn how to be good. Uh-huh. Hence parents, right? Um, and so you look at someone like Jesus. And I imagine that if Jesus had a diary, he would not look back on it and cringe. He would probably go, correct, yep. True. Yep, that's fine. Oh, nice verb usage. You know, it just would have been, it just would have been perfect. It would have been absolutely perfect because Jesus is the only human being who ever lived, never made a mistake, never sinned. There is nothing that Jesus would have done that he would have looked back on in his youth and gone, ah, could have done that better. Ah, why did I say that? Absolute perfection. And so it means that across Jesus' entire life, we can learn from him, the perfect human being. And so we're entering a series where we're looking at the early years of Jesus, essentially looking at the time between Christmas and his public ministry beginning. Essentially, we're looking at the time of his life before he he really did anything. And we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. Luke didn't actually get to meet Jesus out of the four Gospels, Mark and Luke are the only two who weren't actually eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. And it's uh, really um, important that Luke starts his Gospel. He's writing to a friend called Theophilus, and he says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the, from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of what you've been taught. Luke wrote this probably 30 years after Jesus' death, and it is so crucial when we're looking at this gospel in particular, in fact, the entire Bible as a whole, this little phrase, I wrote it so that you may have certainty of what you've been taught. Luke writes this gospel so that we may know, that you may know Jesus lived, that everything in this book is true, accurate, inspired by God, and you can build your life, and you can build your faith on it. And so what we're going to look at over the next six weeks is Jesus, again, every week. But we're looking at that period post-Christmas. And so what I want us to to keep in mind as we come to our text today is you've got the manger, you've got frankincense and myrrh, and you've got the baby in a manger. This is our context, and we're looking at 40 days later. 
So if you join me in Luke 2, uh, verse 22, um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach today. I, I, I'm not going to have like a, a three-point uh, brethren sermon. I'm just going to take us through uh, the narrative. It's a wonderful little story, and I'm just going to call out little observations as we go. But what we're going to see are, are sort of two, two planes operating at the same time. We're going to look at the very humanity of Jesus, the humility of his incarnation, at the same time, there's this, there's this lane, this stream of his glory and of his majesty, and the two sort of run parallel as we look through this. Luke 2, 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves, or two young pigeons. Joseph and Mary are still living under the Mosaic law, and so there are things required by God's law that people needed to do uh, to obey him, to show their devoutness and their holiness. And, and Luke is making the point here, Joseph and Mary were devout followers of God. They loved him. They obeyed his laws. These were holy people. And this ritual that he's talking about in terms of the purification rites is what uh, God commanded his people in Exodus chapter 13. The Lord commands the Israelites to consecrate, which means to set apart to him every firstborn male of every womb. So every firstborn male animal, every firstborn male son. And this meant sacrificing the animal and redeeming the son from the priestly service by making a payment of five shekels. And this ritual was to be a constant reminder to the people of what God had done in Egypt, rescuing them from slavery. And the Lord said, it would be like a sign on your hand. It would be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your foreheads that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. It's like saying that every time you come to the temple to, to, to consecrate your firstborn son, it is going to be a blatant, in-your-face reminder, God rescued us. Here's my firstborn son. That's right. God rescued our ancestors from slavery. But more than that, there is a requirement on the mother to observe the purification rites following childbirth. And it's set down in Leviticus 12.8. It says the mother would need to bring a lamb and offer that to make atonement for sin and a dove or a young pigeon. But if she couldn't afford a lamb, if she was too poor to afford a lamb, there was a condition in the law that meant you could bring two birds instead. And so this is why they've come to the temple today. This is why 40 days later they've arrived at the temple to fulfill these basic rituals. And so they enter the temple grounds. And Luke 2, 25 to 26, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Holy Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Here's a man full of the Holy Spirit 30 years before the Spirit had been poured out at Pentecost. This is a man whose life is just dedicated to God. And what an amazing thing God had promised him that, Simeon, you will not die until you see the Messiah. And from the reading of the text, it seems that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus have come to the temple, and Simeon comes and sort of maybe interrupts them before they get to go and offer the sacrifice. And I think that's really important, and we'll come back to that later. But Simeon sees them. There's a mom and a dad holding a little baby, walking towards the priest. There might have been dozens of other people doing the same thing on that day. But God says, go see them. And he walks up and he sees baby Jesus and then he takes him in his arms. And then chapter 2, 28 to 32, Simeon took baby Jesus in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. I think you can feel the emotion of this moment. 
Can you imagine being in Simeon's shoes? You're waiting, it says, for the consolation of Israel, for the promised Messiah to come. I think for me, the closest thing I can imagine is, is, is when I was young and my dad would travel for work and he'd be away for a week, sometimes weeks at a time. And my brothers and I would just wait for him to come back and we would count the days, you know, seven days, six days. And mum's going, seven days, six days, you know, like three boys. It's pretty intense, but just longing for dad to come home. And when he gets home, you run to the door and sometimes there's tears. It's just, ah, oh, dad is home. And I think what Simeon is experiencing here is that times a million. They'd been waiting centuries for this Messiah and now he holds him in his arms. And Luke says that, that Simeon says, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. But I think Simeon would have exploded with praise. He would have exploded in this moment and just sovereign Lord. He essentially says, God, I can die now. I've seen it. I can die happy now. I have seen all that I need. He was waiting for the promised one. The Jews were waiting for this promised Messiah, the one who would liberate them from Rome, who would liberate them from oppression. They expected a king to come. And, they, and when he saw baby Jesus, he said, this is it. This is an amazing moment. And then Simeon prophesies over this boy. He says, this boy is God's salvation. He says, God, I have seen your salvation. He's looking in the eyes of an infant. And he says, I've seen your salvation. He didn't see an army. He didn't see a king. He didn't see a warrior. He saw a baby boy. So many people didn't see it. I don't know how many people would have been in the temple that day. They all would have seen the baby but only Simeon saw him because God allowed him. You know, I think we see this in what Paul writes to, um, to the Philippians. He says, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own, his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. No one was looking for someone like him. This is the author of life in the flesh. And Simeon sees it. And he goes on, he calls him God's salvation. Then he also says this Jesus is a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. This prophetic glimpse of this little baby in a dusty temple is huge. The Jews are waiting for their Messiah. And Simeon says, yes, he will be. He calls him Israel's glory. Because the scriptures say that salvation comes through the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. But he says it's so much more than that. He's a light for the Gentiles. This goes beyond the Jewish nation. It's a light for the Gentiles. It is salvation for the whole world. This baby Jesus is about to change the course of history. Hope for all nations, all peoples, all tribes, all tongues. Christianity is not a Western religion. It's hope for the whole world, every culture, every people. And so you can imagine Mary and Joseph standing in the temple. They kind of just want to go and, and offer their, their, do their, um, perform their ritual. And, and Simeon's come along and he's just proclaiming wonders over this boy. And it says that Mary and Joseph marvel at what he says. And then Simeon turns his attention to Mary and he says, Mary, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. We're still in the temple. They're probably still holding the two birds. It's gone from praise and wonder and awe and glory to something very serious to, said directly to Mary. Simeon says, Mary, your son, there's something special about him. He's going to turn the world on its head. And something is going to happen to him, Mary, that is going to hurt you like hell. And I choose that word intentionally. It is going to hurt her like hell. He says, Jesus is destined. This boy is destined. His mission was set and sure from the foundation of the earth. And he said it was to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. I hark back to Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 8.14 that says, Jesus will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. He says, this baby will grow to be someone, to a sign that will be spoken against and will reveal the thoughts of many hearts. We see that in Jesus' ministry. So many people hated him. 
So many people spoke against him, said awful things about him. People spoke against the author of life. And then Simeon warns Mary this will come at a cost to her. And that's a prophetic glimpse of the way that Jesus would suffer and die. And I wonder if at this point Mary's mouth just might have dropped a little bit. Because months before, Mary had sung a song of praise to God. And she sang these lyrics. She said, God has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Look at those lines I've underlined there. Look at what Simeon says about Jesus. He says, this child will cause the rising and falling of many, brought down, lifted up. And he says, the son, this child will reveal the thoughts of many hearts. Mary before had worshipped God and said, God, you reveal the thoughts of hearts, the thoughts of the hearts of people. You make people rise. You make people fall. And then Simeon says, here he is. This same baby will do those same things that Mary had sung to God about. And Simeon says, this boy will do the same thing. There's a glimpse of his glory right there and then. This is where we see that dual nature of Jesus all the way through. A baby on his way to have these, these rituals done and yet amazing things are being spoken over his life. We see prophetic glimpses of who he really is. You know, I think this is why Christianity never really does that well when it's in the seat of power. It kind of goes against the grain of, of, of apprenticeship to Jesus. Jesus came in the most humble, lowly, basic of ways. He walked dusty streets. He wasn't rich. He wasn't particularly powerful in a political sense. You know, this is why we call it the up -down, um, upside down kingdom. It's the poor in spirit who have the kingdom of God. It's the meek who inherit the earth. It's the merciful who will be shown mercy. It's the, the last who will be first. It says, if you want to be a leader, you become the servant of all. Woe to the rich. That's why Paul says to the Romans that we should always be willing to associate with those of low position because if we don't, we're missing out on associating ourselves with the ones that Jesus came most to identify him with. This is a very normal humble, average beginning to his life. And then Simeon stops talking, and then another old lady, uh, not another old lady, an old lady comes in, Anna, she's a prophetess. She's, some say she's over 100 years old. We know she's at least in her 80s, and she spends all her time in the temple, worshiping, praising, fasting. And she comes and declares wonders over Jesus. And then they go and they turn to the priest, all this ringing in their ears, wonder, glory. The amazing things this boy will do. They go to the priest and they're bringing their firstborn son, a reminder that God rescued our ancestors from slavery in Egypt. And yet in their arms was a son who would rescue the whole world from slavery to sin. They hand over five shekels to redeem their son from the priestly service, to redeem their son's life. And yet their son would pay with his life to redeem the whole of humanity. The priest says, do you have a lamb to make atonement for sin? And Mary says, no, I just have these two birds. And yet in her arms is the spotless lamb of God who will not only pay for her sin, but for the sin of the whole world. I think the potency of that moment is breathtaking, is absolutely breathtaking. The majesty of the king, this humble baby in her arms, the king of kings and the lord of lords who will turn the world on its head. He comes in a context of poverty and of weakness and yet he is the most powerful, incredible, wonderful human being who has ever lived. And so they turn away from the priest, and then Luke finishes by saying that Mary and Joseph did everything required of them by the law of the Lord. In humble obedience, 
against the backdrop of suffering and oppression under Roman rule at the time and circumstances of poverty and hardship, knowing that more pain was coming in their life, they did everything that was required of them by the law of the Lord. So what's required of us in the context of of living as spiritual exiles under in a post-Christian world where being a Christian isn't that popular? In fact, Christian ideals are seen as deadly. Some of you, you probably, you might be in circumstances of poverty or hardship. For almost all of us, there are going to be times of pain ahead. What is required of us? What do we see in Mary and Joseph in these early days of Jesus' life? They did everything that was required of them. What is required of us? You know, um, thought came of what God says in Micah 6, 8. I've shown you, O man, what is required of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 